Number 6. Jack Kevorkian, the Angel of Mercy Jack Kevorkian, born to Armenian immigrants in 1928, remains a controversial figure in the realm of medicine. Very little is known about his early life other than the fact that he had two sisters and was considered the favorite child. Kevorkian's intelligence and sense of humor were apparent to all who knew him. His fascination with death began early in his medical career, when he chose to work night shifts during his residency as a pathologist, believing more people died at night. He even attempted to photograph individuals at the moment of their death, to study their eye movements, earning him the nickname Dr. Death. During his residency, Kevorkian had an unconventional idea. He proposed using condemned convicts for experiments and execution under general anesthesia, a concept that was met with disapproval from the medical community. Lethal injection had not yet been introduced as a method of execution, and hanging and the electric chair were the primary means of capital punishment. But despite his initial failure to gain support, Kevorkian's ideas resurfaced in the 1970s when he began advocating for merciful executions and vivisection on convicts with the added possibility of organ harvesting. However, his controversial proposals drew parallels to the Nazi experiments in death camps, which were met with strong opposition. Undeterred, Kevorkian persisted in pushing his agenda. In the late 1970s, he constructed a machine, the Mercytron, to facilitate merciful executions. This device included sodium pentothal to induce unconsciousness, potassium chloride to cause death, and a saline solution to initiate the IV drip. And Kevorkian assembled this makeshift machine using common household materials. His search for a subject led him to a 54-year-old woman diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and experiencing depression. A member of the Hemlock Society, she sought assistance in ending her own life as a rational choice. Kevorkian recorded her story and she ultimately used the Mercytron to end her life, making headlines and marking the start of Kevorkian's notoriety. Kevorkian's involvement in assisting people who wanted to die continued, involving terminally ill and disabled individuals and those suffering from severe depression. Although he lost his medical license and faced legal challenges, he maintained his commitment to what he considered a humanitarian mission. Despite the controversy and opposition, Kevorkian remained steadfast in his belief that he was advocating for a more humane approach to death. Driven by his mission to make death meaningful through experimentation and organ harvesting, even if his methods and ethics were highly contested. Number 5. Linda Laura Hazard, the Starvation Doctor Born in 1867, Linda Laura Hazard, often dubbed the Starvation Doctor, was an American charlatan and convicted serial killer who gained notoriety for her bizarre medical practices. She had no legitimate medical degree, but managed to practice medicine in Washington through a legal loophole. Hazard advocated for fasting, pummeling, and lengthy enemas as treatments for various illnesses, touting them as a universal cure that could eliminate bodily toxins and restore balance. She even authored three books on fasting's supposed scientific basis and its curative powers, establishing the Wilderness Heights Sanitarium in Olala, Washington. She subjected patients to extreme fasting regimens, offering minimal sustenance, often constituting of tomato or asparagus juice. And while some survived and publicly supported her methods, many under her care perished. She claimed they had undisclosed illnesses, while critics contended that they died from starvation, earning the facility the nickname Starvation Heights. In 1912, Hazard was convicted of manslaughter for her role in the death of Claire Williamson, a British woman who weighed less than 50 pounds at her demise. It was later revealed that Hazard had forged Williams's will and stolen her valuables. Williamson's sister was also under the care of Hazard and took the same treatment. The surviving sister, Dorothea, testified against her, and as a result, she was sentenced to 2 to 20 years in prison. Hazard only served two years though, and she was later pardoned by Governor Ernest Lister. After her release, Hazard moved to New Zealand, where she practiced as a dietitian and osteopath. She also faced legal trouble there for practicing medicine without proper registration. After returning to Olala, she operated a new sanitarium, 
even though her medical license had been revoked, dubbing it a school of health. But in 1935, the establishment burnt down and was never rebuilt. Hazard's own life followed her dangerous principles. In 1938, she died of starvation while attempting a fasting cure she had created. And in her wake, she leaves behind a legacy marked by deceit, manipulation, and a hazardous approach to healthcare. Number 4. H. H. Holmes, America's First Serial Killer Herman Webster Mudgett, famously known as H. H. Holmes, holds the grim distinction of being America's first known serial killer. His dark fascination with medicine began in childhood, when he conducted ghastly surgeries on animals and there are even speculations for him being responsible for the death of a childhood playmate. Born in Gilmanton, New Hampshire in 1861, he was the third child born to his parents, Theodate Page Price and Levy Horton Mudgett. He excelled at school and proved to be rather intelligent, graduating from his high school Gilmanton Academy with honors when he was just 16 years old. In 1878, Holmes enrolled in the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery, and he got in. Then, after passing his exams, he earned his diploma in June of 1884. After completing medical school, Holmes embarked on a sinister journey, starting as a pharmacist in Chicago. But he soon turned to murder to satisfy his insatiable greed. In an eerie turn of events, he constructed a building that's now infamous as the Murder Castle. This structure was a house of horrors, equipped with secret passages, trap doors, soundproof rooms, gas jets for asphyxiation, and even a kiln for the cremation of his victims. During the world's Columbian Exposition of 1893, Holmes, a charismatic charmer, befriended numerous women, lured them into his web of deceit, gained control of their finances, and ultimately murdered them. But this was not the extent of his malice. He demanded that his employees take out life insurance policies naming him as the sole beneficiary, weaving a sinister financial web around his victims. The complete scope of his heinous crimes remained shrouded in uncertainty, with estimates of the number of victims ranging well above 200. Many of the bodies he left behind were sold to medical schools, a grotesque aftermath of his nefarious acts. Holmes' descent into darkness eventually caught up with him in 1893, when he was arrested for insurance fraud related to a fire in his home. However, the deeper layers of his criminality began to unravel, and eventually he was convicted of murder and was sentenced to death. H. H. Holmes remains a chilling figure in American history, a harbinger of horrors that can lurk behind the facade of a seemingly ordinary individual. Out of morbid curiosity, would you ever visit H. H. Holmes' murder castle in Chicago? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, subscribe to the channel to join the Bad Badger fam. Number 3. Marcel Petju, Dr. Satan Dr. Marcel Petju, infamously known as Dr. Satan, was a malevolent figure during World War II in France. His sinister activities came to light during the war, as many sought refuge from Nazi persecution. However, instead of providing them with safe passage, Petchu orchestrated their permanent disappearance. Petchu, a doctor and a fraudster, lured his victims to his residence with the promise of false identity papers and medical certificates for a fee of 25,000 francs. But in reality, he had darker intentions. He claimed that he was assisting them in escaping to Argentina, a destination that required vaccinations. As a supposed medical professional, he administered injections himself. These injections, however, were loaded with deadly cyanide. The basement he led his victims to was airtight, creating a horrifying chamber of death. Cyanide, while not always instantly lethal, sealed their fate. And if anyone miraculously survived, Petju used gas to suffocate them. He even watched the horrors unfold through a peephole he installed. To dispose of the bodies, Petju dismembered them and dissolved the remains in acid. He used a saw to cut the victims into smaller, more manageable pieces. These dismembered body parts were then placed in a large container filled with quicklime and water, a gruesome method to dissolve the flesh and bones, leaving behind only a sludge-like residue. 
His horrifying activities resulted in an array of human remains, including charred bones, unidentified body parts, human sculpts, and severed heads, all horrifying evidence of his gruesome crimes. Petchu's sinister tendencies were not limited to wartime. In the 1920s, he had been involved in various fraudulent schemes and was convicted of fraud. And although he was sentenced to five years in prison, he managed to escape by faking a seizure and subsequently fled. In 1943, the Gestapo became aware of Petchu's network, but they initially believed it was a genuine operation to smuggle refugees out of France. Their investigation revealed Petchu's murders, yet they chose to turn a blind eye. The Gestapo possibly saw his activities as a way to eliminate Jews and other undesirables, aligning with their objectives. Petchu's reign of terror finally ended when a neighbor reported a putrid odor emanating from his property in March 1944. That's when police discovered horrifying evidence of his crimes, including a furnace burning with a human arm protruding from it. Petru attempted to evade justice by claiming his victims were Nazi infiltrators and traitors, painting himself as a patriot aiding the French resistance. And astonishingly, it worked because French police released him. However, upon closer examination, it became evident that his victims were all of Jewish descent. A manhunt ensued and he was eventually recognized in a Paris metro station on Halloween in 1944. The authorities found him with a pistol, over 31,000 francs, and 50 sets of identity papers. Throughout the ordeal, Petchu maintained his innocence, but his claims lacked substance. On May 15, 1946, he walked toward the guillotine on death row, claiming his conscience was clear. But it was evident from his heinous acts that the man possessed no conscience to begin with. Number 2. Walter Freeman, the father of lobotomy. Dr. Walter Jackson Freeman II, a name associated with the darker chapters of medical history, was an American physician who was infamous for his role in promoting and performing lobotomies. Freeman sought to simplify lobotomies, making them accessible for psychiatric hospitals, often lacking operating rooms, surgeons or anesthesia. His solution was the creation of a transorbital lobotomy procedure. This method, known as the ice pick approach, involved inserting an instrument similar to an ice pick, called an orbitoclast, under the eyelid and into the eye socket. Then, with a mallet, Freeman drove this instrument through the thin bone into the brain. This approach bypassed the need for neurosurgeons and traditional surgical conditions, often performed by untrained psychiatrists without anesthesia, inducing unconsciousness with electroconvulsive therapy. This radical modification of the lobotomy did not sit well with Freeman's partner, Dr. James W. Watts, who distanced himself from Freeman's practices. Nonetheless, Freeman's unorthodox procedure gained notoriety and widespread use. He traveled across the United States, visiting mental institutions and performing lobotomies, ultimately claiming to have conducted as many as 4,000 throughout his career. But his approach took a tragic turn when a patient died during the procedure, causing public outrage. Despite this incident and the high mortality rate associated with his methods, Freeman continued his practices until he was finally banned from performing surgeries in 1967. Freeman's dark legacy endured, with some patients experiencing severe and permanent damage from the lobotomies. His most notorious patient was Rosemary Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy's sister, whose lobotomy left her with severe mental and physical disabilities. Notably, Freeman also performed lobotomies on minors, including a shocking case involving a four-year-old child. His methods were controversial, as he often performed the procedures without gloves or masks. In his later years, Freeman retired and settled in California. His eccentric style, including his cane, goatee, and narrow-brimmed hat, matched his theatrical approach to surgery. Ultimately, Freeman's career left a dark mark on medical history, highlighting the dangers of radical and unproven medical practices. He passed away in 1972, leaving behind a legacy marred by the suffering of countless patients subjected to his controversial procedures. Number 1. Michael Swango, the Poison Doctor Dr. Michael Swango, a physician turned serial killer, 
shattered the trust patients place in their doctors. Born on October 21, 1954, in Tacoma, Washington, Swango's early life seemed promising. His academic prowess and achievements earned him scholarships and opportunities. But a dark obsession with death and a twisted desire to harm patients would come to define his medical career. Swango's journey into the medical field took a disturbing turn during his time at South Illinois University School of Medicine. He began neglecting his studies, often cutting corners, and prioritizing ambulance calls over schoolwork to be closer to dying or critically injured patients. Suspicious incidents arose, with patients experiencing life-threatening emergencies during Swango's individual sessions. And as a result, several patients died under his care. In 1983, despite his lackluster academic reputation, Swango landed a medical internship at Ohio State University Medical Center. And shortly thereafter, healthy patients began mysteriously dying during his duty hours. Nurses filed complaints about his unusual behavior, entering the patient's room at random hours. But nevertheless, he evaded scrutiny. Swango's turbulent journey continued as he was fired from his ambulance job. So he joined various workplaces, leaving a trail of poisoned co-workers in his wake. His malicious acts included a particularly disturbing episode where anyone who ate his food became violently ill. This raised suspicion, leading to a police investigation. Authorities found a supply of drugs, books on poison, and arsenic in his home, and he was convicted of aggravated battery in 1985. Remarkably though, Swango was released from prison in 1987 after serving only two of his five-year sentence. Once he was free, he returned to work as a career counselor, but his sinister tendencies resurfaced. His arrival led to colleagues being hospitalized, complaints of severe nausea, and brought an executive of the company perilously close to falling into a coma. During this time, Swango met Kristen Kinney, a nurse, and they embarked on a relationship. In 1991, Swango, now using the name David Jackson Adams, managed to secure a spot in a residency program at the University of South Dakota Medical Center. He concealed his criminal history, leaving a trail of mistrust and destruction as patients under his care continued to die. Swango's deception caught up with him when his true identity was exposed to the American Medical Association during an extensive background check. This led to his resignation from the program, but he left a grieving and confused Kristen behind. In 1994, Swango ventured to Zimbabwe, where he landed a job at Menene Lutheran Mission Hospital. Suspicious patient deaths and concerns from nurses led to a police search of his home, revealing an alarming stash of drugs and poisons. Swango was fired, but the evidence against him continued to pile up. As investigations in Zimbabwe progressed, Swango sought to restore his medical license and began preparations to flee the country. However, he was arrested during a layover at Chicago O'Hare Airport in June 1997. Fraud charges led to his arrest and subsequent guilty plea in 1998. Federal prosecutors filed a criminal complaint against him in Long Island, charging him with multiple crimes, including murder. Swango eventually pleaded guilty to these charges in September 2000 avoiding the death penalty in New York, but receiving three consecutive life sentences for his crimes. He currently resides in the United States Penitentiary Administrative Maximum Facility, known as the Alcatraz of the Rockies. Which of these doctors was the absolute worst? Let us know what you think in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time on Bad Badger.